This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Frances Fry. She's a professor at Harvard. Her new book, Move Fast and Fix Things, The Trusted Leader's Guide to Solving Hard Problems. I like the way that Frances breaks apart complicated issues, especially in this day and age where seemingly everything is controversial. She was even reflective enough in this conversation to take apart something that I observed that I thought was controversial she broke it apart, acknowledged it, and essentially put her own bias on the plate. A very useful, interesting way to break pieces down to their base elements to have a better conversation. Without any further delay from me, let's jump right into a little moving fast and fixing things with Francis Fry. I hope you enjoy. I felt like probably the place that we should jump in right out of the gate, I think starting with this famous Facebook motto, maybe we won't get away from this, the whole conversation, but back in the day, and you can correct me if my memory is wrong, I think in their IPO prospectus around the office, the expression was at Facebook, move fast and break things. I never really thought much of that as a startup guy back in the day and still with a startup mindset. I felt like that's the way things are. Now, if a company gets to have buku bucks in the bank, you can do anything. You can clean up whatever mess took place to get from the baby stages to the big boy stages, so to speak. But why don't you explain your perspective on this famous Facebook motto, how it started to wake you up, make you want to say something different? How did this get into your head other than just hearing it like everybody else? I, like you, when I heard it in the beginning, didn't ever sit right, but I didn't see it as glaringly problematic until Anne and I, more as my wife and co-author, until Anne and I were being invited in to clean up a lot of messes that people who were adopting the move fast and break things were doing. What does that mean? As consultants, you're coming in to companies, either early stage or later stage, and there's messes. I'm the guy that has to dig a little here and find out what kind of messes are we talking about? We call this part of our work firefighting. Sometimes we came in as consultants. I went and joined Uber in 2017, in June of 2017, at the height of its crisis. I left HBS, went and joined there full time to help them overcome their cultural crisis. Why don't you remind people what that crisis was exactly? So in 2017, it's a long time ago, and it's hard to <laughs> even conjure it now. There was a time when people thought the company wasn't going to make it because there was such a public crisis going on. It was on the front page of all of the newspapers that really terrible things were happening to employees, riders. Riders were very upset with the company. Drivers were super upset with the organization, shareholders. Uber had lost trust with all of its constituents. Many were calling for its demise. It was already on the slope down to the demise. I got called by a former student who asked me if I would talk to the then CEO, Travis Kalnick. I said no, because I only help good people win. I was reading the newspaper and I was like, this does not sound like a good person to me. She was like, please just come out and meet him. I think you'll change your mind. Former student, one who I knew very well and admired a lot. I flew across the country for a meeting. That's how long ago it was. Our two-hour meeting lasted three days, changed my flight home five times. We talked about everything going on in the company. And essentially, we determined that he needed help with leadership. That was certainly true in the organization. And also with communicating the strategy. He had partitioned off 
lots of parts of the organization from each other to try to help with hypergrowth, but it also created really bad externalities. The mess was the culture was terrible. What's a good example of that? Like I'm the outsider looking in, guy who's living in Asia for 10 years, who talks to everybody under the sun. What would have been exactly, so we can learn from this experience, what would have been exactly something he was doing wrong that we, us listeners, hearing from you could take away and say, oh, that seems obvious in hindsight, but he was still doing it. The people that got hired there typically had an engineering background, like a very technical background. And the employees were just sensational. And to this day are some of the most amazing people I've ever worked with. Five minutes after they were hired, they got promoted to manager. No training on how to be a manager. Five minutes after they were promoted to manager, they were promoted to manager of manager because the company was growing so fast. Again, no training for how to do it because like many startups that experience what feels like the privilege of hypergrowth, their HR systems were not keeping up in any way, shape or form. There were like a thousand complaints in the organization. 95% north of that all had to do with interactions of some of the 13,000 employees and one of the 3,000 managers. In fact, many of the 3,000 managers. They had a crisis of management. And management to me is a subset of leadership. To be a great leader, you have to be a great manager. They had a total crisis of this. One of the first things we did is brought in an amazing executive education experience to teach everybody how to lead and how to manage. And then there were no complaints. Their problems were not unique, but their context was very, very unique. That's one example of it. They were growing customers and riders rapidly, but they weren't growing the capacity of their employees rapidly. They were hiring superstar engineers, but not train them. And you're not born knowing how to manage. It is a skill. It's what I do with my day job. I teach at a school of management. This is not necessarily unique to tech startups. I mean, we've all read the headlines, read the fortune stories, seen the wild ups and downs and big successes and big failures going back to the dot-com era. It's not necessarily a unique thing that one of these particular tech companies catches fire. We've seen it a lot. I would assume these kinds of problems happen a lot. Yes. I had been advising companies. I'm a technology and operations management professor, which means I get technology and I like to fix things. That's what operations management is like, optimally design. And then when something breaks, get in there and fix it. From my perspective, I had seen this challenge before, but what was unique about tech was just how fast you could have hyper growth. Oh my gosh, you could go from... 300 employees to 3,000 to 13,000 employees at a breathtaking pace that you can do that in the non-tech world, but it's much, much more rare to do it there. So I think that's why tech being very technical, so you hired people that were unlikely to have management training in their history, prior management experience, you experience growth that the world just wasn't prepared for, that no HR systems were prepared for, particularly at young organizations. To your point on the novelty, we found no novel problems. In fact, I haven't found a novel problem in quite some time. But the interaction of a problem and a context, that's always unique. This particular two-sided platform, like the reason the riders were mad at Uber was because of how Uber was treating the drivers. That's a very unusual or novel context that's awesome, by the way, but it's also why this was a challenging situation. So I'm going to take you back to Facebook in a second, but you brought something up a moment ago, and I thought I would bring it around to another tech wonder kind, so to speak. We got to witness Twitter unfold in the last while since Musk bought Twitter. I thought it was really, really interesting to watch how he made changes. As an outsider, I had seen enough of these videos of primarily young ladies showing up at the office, talking about their day at Facebook or LinkedIn and getting a coffee and playing foosball and all these kinds of things. And I'm like, oh my God, these companies are floating in cash. People are hired and they're not doing anything. 
look, I'm not the only person that had this feeling. We've all seen these crazy videos. Musk comes in and Musk seemingly did what you were saying was probably not the best thing with Uber. It looks like Musk took Twitter and cut it to its bare bones of engineers. Yeah. There were a lot of self-inflicted wounds that, from my perspective as an outsider, I don't know anything about the company internally. I want to be clear about that. But having said that, oh my gosh, does it look like he created so many self-inflicted wounds that were absolutely unnecessary. It was as if he didn't have the opportunity to learn from the history of the organizations that were all around him. He went in and broke things. <laughs> when you don't have to break things. That was a broken operation though, wasn't it? Oh, he made it so much worse, my goodness. I don't know how broken it was. I really don't because from the user's perspective- Nothing's changed. That's actually not true. From the user's perspective, Twitter used to be a lovely place to go and get news. If you go on that site now, there's so much hostility. There's so much negativity. It's become a pretty dark place. From the user's experience, the advertisements you used to get were pretty on point. And now you can see why people aren't advertising on it anymore. Elon managed to alienate so many people that were golden assets. People adored Twitter. Everyone who adored Twitter, none of them are verified users anymore. But the verified users used to be this really reliable set of people that were not ashamed to be verified. Now there's like a stigma associated with being it. Let me just say, this is typically the kind of call we get, which is no new problems, very fascinating context, so fixable, but almost nothing he did fixed any of its problems. Let me push back a little bit and offer that I started to witness, especially during the pandemic era, first on Facebook. Okay, and then we start to hear the stories. We all know there were some severe flamethrowing type people that got banned. But then these bannings and censorship started to go to typical people that might have said the wrong thing. I think that also factors into a guy like Musk, at least for me, as an outsider reading it, it seems like... He probably didn't even want to buy this thing. He made this bet, so to speak. Then he does it. I think some people could look at Twitter right now and say it's dark. I've seen other people say the opposite. The censorship part and the banning part on social media, I don't know if you were planning on addressing that. It comes up because if we only look at Twitter and Musk's actions as something all negative, I mean, there are more people that can speak now. Whether some people like that speech there are more people that can speak now. Here's what I would say to that. Musk banned people at his own whim. There wasn't a, like a rigorous system that you could be transparent about. He did more banning and censorship than any previous leader. And you could watch it real time. That was the thing that was amazing. He would get annoyed at someone on a tweet and he would ban them. And then he would set a policy and then violate that policy by banning someone else. I don't think that the culture of banning was unique to pre him. In fact, I know he speaks about free speech. He actually bans people who disagree with him, and he did it quite famously. I spend my life trying to make sure that we are all inclusive of one another, and that is that the more difference that's represented, the more awesome we're going to be. I think what he did is created an environment where he opened it up to more people, but I have to say, and all of the research tells me, the use of the N-word, the use of attacks on people has skyrocketed. People weren't going on the offense before. I think people disagreed with people's points of view. Now it's been, for some people, and I don't know what your messages are like, I don't know if you're a straight white man, but mostly straight white men aren't subjected to these harms as a queer woman. You would be appalled if you read what is just incoming for me, or famously look at what goes on for Kara Swisher. I've written a bunch of investment books, and I am pretty in that space. When I make observations of social media, it doesn't seem like to me that there is one side or the other that is more or less evil. It seems like there are two sides. 
there are extremes on either of these sides and the extremes will get hot and heavy. I think it's always been the case. Yeah, fair enough. Nobody wants to hear the ad hominem and the smears and the attacks and all that kind of stuff. I just wonder though, without having data, my gut would tell me, since America's become a pretty polarized place, my gut would tell me that the messaging and the attacks are pretty polarizing from each side. Do you think it's a fair assumption? No, I'll tell you, I have seen some research papers. It's pretty clear that both sides don't have the same propensity to attack. And also just personally, I can tell you as someone who experiences attacks due to my demographics solely, that it feels quite different. Again, I'm not going to say all of this is Elon's fault, but I will say that he created an environment and even participated. He has millions and millions of followers. And this is what I mean by they were self-inflicted wounds. He would pour gasoline on fires of negativity. And then that would just encourage it more and more and more. And he can get millions and millions of people to respond. So there was nothing ever like that. If there's people on the left that are fighting first, they don't tend to be as attacking. And second, there is no great amplifier for it. You do realize that people on the right would probably counter. I guess the issue for me is I don't know that either of us have it. The issue really becomes the data. I agree. And take a look at the research. So there's been beautiful research done. The data is quite conclusive. I believe reasonable people can disagree. Every single research paper that's been done has shown that it has skyrocketed. That's my interpretation of the data. Other people can look at it. But lots of research has been done on this. My larger point, though, which back to the HR point with Uber, Musk has come in, okay, mistakes are made. People have got different views on these mistakes. Maybe some people think Twitter is an entirely different animal now. It is operating. I would guess behind the scenes, given the guy's track record with other companies, he's progressing and whatever mistakes they've made, they're trying to fix. The reason I brought it up, though, ultimately was the what appears to be a lean and mean type workforce now compared to the prior Twitter workforce. Yes. Whether or not everything is perfect about the business, it does seem like it's operating with a tremendously decreased workforce, which I also wonder from your perspective, is that influencing other companies to say, whoa, if this guy, the big guy in the block, if this guy can do with less staff, can we? This was ultimately what I was trying to put on your plate. I love that very much. I feel like every single tech company I've ever gone to is somewhere between 30 and 50% overstaffed. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. So you got to say that again. Hold on. 30 to 50%? 30 to 50% overstaffed. Okay. So my gut was right. <laughs> this is my observation. I haven't seen research on this. I have seen that every time. It's not that the employees are lazy, but they like to start projects. They don't like to end projects. There is proliferation. I believe in getting an organization to its appropriate size. If you look at the way that Twitter did it, one is they cut the whole advertising team. You can do that, but then they have no revenue. They used to have loads of revenue, billions of dollars in revenue, and their revenue went to zero because they cut the revenue team, which is the advertising team. They used to have great security. They cut almost all of the security teams. It's less secure. They used to have really stable infrastructure. They cut most of the infrastructure team. So the question is, are you cutting the core parts or are you cutting the shiny objects part? In my view, organizations need to cut the shiny objects part and you just need a regular culling of shiny objects. When you cut the core part, you're creating problems for down the line. So you're going to look like a hero. You cut costs, but somebody's going to have to build back advertising. Somebody's going to have to build back security. Somebody's going to have to build back infrastructure. We can guess they probably are. And I think that's what they're doing now. So you'll see the costs increase, but you'll also see the revenue increase. 30 to 50% is just mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. I completely agree. Now, I will also say, by the way, I'm not saying that non-tech companies are right-sized either. We just get used to doing things as they were done. We get tempted to add as a solution, not realizing that one of the things that slows us down is work in process. 
So if we remove the work and process, we can move much faster. And this is one of the things we talk about in Move Fast and Fix Things is that if you remove work and process, everything else gets to speed up. There are so many shiny objects of work and process in tech companies and other companies that if we remove those, everything gets faster. And that's, I think, the first thing. The second thing I'll say is that Mark Zuckerberg gave speed a bad name when he said, move fast and break things. Here's what I mean by that. It made it sound like the only alternative was to move slow. That turns out to not be the antidote to move fast and break things. The antidote to move fast and break things is to fix them along the way. At the center of every problem, what he did is he said, look, we have a choice between honoring humanity or moving fast. We have found that when you honor humanity, you can move faster. Move fast and fix things goes so much faster than any of these folks ever, ever could do when they were moving fast and breaking things. And that's why I think Twitter or these other examples, from my operations mind, I'm like, this is so unnecessary. You could have achieved your goals and then some if you had only done it from a more rigorous operational perspective. You talk about a rigorous operational perspective, but you just use the phrase honor humanity. I just want you to clarify, I don't like the fact that during the pandemic, I posted a link to the CDC and Facebook suspended me for two weeks with no understanding why that happened. So I have to lay out my bias against Facebook right there. No, it's terrible. That's terrible. I don't like the idea of just being censored and whatnot. I don't either. What's interesting is I don't think that Mark, so as I lay out my bias, I don't think Mark had a negative feeling towards humanity necessarily. And I'm going to let you explain your position. It just seems like back to the startup approach. I mean, we all saw the movie. I don't know how accurate the movie was. There was that startup mentality. I'm sure until one feels, if you happen to be lucky enough to ride that bucking Bronco that's going to the moon, if you happen to be Mark Zuckerberg in that position, there's probably always a feeling of like, well, someone's coming for me. We might not be the winner. We might not make it. Somebody might overtake us. And so I would think that paranoia back to the old Andy Grove line, only the paranoid survived. I would think that that startup mentality, until you get to a place in a position in the corner of the room over there is more cash than God has. I think we passed the test. I think we're okay. And at that point in time, I guess you can then make different decisions. But I think you're falling into the same trap that they fell into, which is you think the antidote to move fast and break things is move slow and fix things. It's a false trade-off that you can either move fast and break things, or you move slow and fix things. So you just went exactly to that. We can move faster than move fast and break things if we move fast and fix things. We can move faster. I want to get it to a specific example, if there is one that you can share about Facebook in particular, because we're talking generalities here. What would have been something that would have occurred that he could have done differently and that he was breaking and kind of making a mess along the way. Pick your favorite thing that he broke and I'll tell you how he could have moved faster if he fixed it. I don't know enough about him. I mean, Facebook to me seems, it just keeps adding new features. I guess during the election, people are gonna say, well, he took advertisements from somebody, they didn't like that. But I mean, I don't think that's the real issue you're talking about. I think you're talking about something else. No, I don't think that's the real issue. The reason that I'm asking for the thing that was broken, if you start there to show how to fix it, because wherever anything is broken, it's a breakdown in trust. Do you have an example, though, with Facebook in particular, that you thought something was broken? I've never worked with Facebook. I've never worked with Twitter. You'll have to forgive me there. I only know it from the outside perspective. But let me give you examples I've seen from the outside perspective. If you look for how Instagram grew, because that's part of Facebook. It is now, and I don't mean this to be a controversial statement, but the data is super clear that it's not awesome for teenage girls. Let me check to see if that's a controversial statement. I'll let you clarify. What do you mean by that? All of the data suggests that girls that are on Instagram end up with lower self-esteem than girls that are not on Instagram. Dramatically lower I'm Gen X, so I grew up with no internet for half my life and internet for half my life. So that gives you some perspective. This was not something that the teen girls that I grew up with had to deal with. No, 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 we didn't have to deal with it. But do you know anyone who has teen girls today? I have an 18-year-old niece. 
18 year old niece. And so she would be of the age that if she was on Instagram four or five years ago, or three, four or five years ago, she would certainly have known people for whom being on Instagram was affecting their self-esteem, often in very dramatic ways. From my perspective, this isn't a controversial statement because the research is super clear on this statement. I could tell you how he could have fixed that without breaking it. Or we can pick another more mainstream problem. You can stay there. Ultimately, just as a caveat to all of these social media platforms, I've always envisioned them and I thought the original intent of them was that essentially, not unlike the First Amendment gives us this right, that we all just communicate. If somebody's yelling fire in a crowded theater or there's a libel or there's threats and whatnot, then there was an entire legal system to deal with that. I guess the part that's always been a little confusing for me is how we all expected these particular companies. And I know they've got some interesting privileges and some interesting uh, legal classifications and political classifications. I've always thought it's a little bit interesting how we can expect these folks to do everything. That said, clearly, if they can manage certain issues, it's better for their business. I'm mostly with you. I will have a caveat when it comes to underage people. If you're doing things specifically to target teens, and you know your own internal research shows you, and this is what Francis Hogan, who was the whistleblower of Facebook, brought to everyone's attention. They knew, rigorously, they knew that their product was bad for girls. They pretended they didn't know. And then when they got caught, they said, oh, we couldn't have done anything about it. Nonsense. Of course, they could have done something about it. They were accelerating it along the way, accelerating the process. Yeah. It wouldn't even have been technically difficult. You know who everyone is. You give them feeds. We're not even talking about a hard technical challenge. They just didn't want to fix it, to your point, along the way. That slowed them down so much by having to deal with the collateral damage of that. Why do you think that was? Do you think that was maybe an inherent libertarian type perspective of live and let live? I don't think so, because they were pretty sheepish when all of this came out. Why did they do it then? Why did they not do what you're talking about? Because they thought you could either move fast and break things or move slow. They didn't want to move slow. They didn't realize, hence the need for this book, they didn't realize that you could move even faster if you fixed things along the way. They believed the only way to move fast was to break things. And that's a hard trade-off. I'm going to be really honest. Okay, they want to have all of these young ladies use their product. They want that. They knew there was a problem. They had the research. They knew this was a profitable demographic for them. They probably knew that there was going to be a problem, but they felt like, let's just keep going. All steamship straight ahead. When we get farther along, we'll come back and fix that issue. Yes, that's exactly right. And here's what I would say. If you fix things along the way and learn how to figure out the problems, your steamship, you can add zeros to your steamship. There is a false dichotomy in people's minds that I have to slow down to fix things. And what we have found is you can speed up when you fix things. Move fast and break things gave speed a bad name. I care about speed more than anyone on the planet. I'm an operations professor. It's friction. It breaks my heart when we slow down. But it also breaks my heart when we break things. And it turns out you can move even faster, which is probably what we should have called the book, move even faster if you also fix things. Let me throw this out. We don't have the privilege of having Mark on this call right now. Mark is a smart, wealthy guy. Oh, gosh, yes. If I was sitting in the middle of the stage and I had you both on the stage in a debate and I'm moderating the debate, what is Mark's reply to your criticism? What is he saying? Is he agreeing with you? Well, I think he'd say, fair enough, we moved fast and broke things, but I don't believe we could move fast and fix things. I made a choice that speed and momentum were the most important thing for the company. And look, it's a super profitable company, super fast growing company. I would be like, yeah, fair enough. When you have the only two choices you think you have, I think reasonable people can disagree about what to do. What we have learned 
Hence why we've written this book so that we can open source it to everyone so that you don't have to invite us in as a consultant to do it. We're telling the world how to do it. If I said to Mark, if you could have moved even faster and broken far fewer things, would you have done it? Of course he would say yes. Of course he would say yes. He just wouldn't believe it's possible. Then I would entice him. I'd be like, okay, pick any problem you have. It's what I tried to do with you. I did it unsuccessfully and I apologize for that. Pick any problem you have. I will guarantee you that trust is broken at the center of it. And if we can fix the trust broken at the center of it, that's step one of doing it. Most people think that rebuilding trust takes a long time. You can rebuild trust in an instant. Again, all of these myths that we have or this conventional wisdom, we turn all of it on its head to give you the blueprint for how to do it. It is super counterintuitive. I know you're not going there in terms of your use of the word trust to go to the larger let's say, political, cultural, social issues of America, trust. I was thinking of a first question when I was getting prepared to talk to you, and I was thinking about the word trust because it does seem like, if I take our conversation to cruising altitude in a 787, it does seem like across America, trust has gone. I can recall in the 80s, in the 90s, you might have differing uh, presidents, Democrat, Republican, whatnot, it used to feel like, okay, the political parties in America have differences of opinion. But now it seems like in terms of trust, and I'm curious your perspective here, and I'm curious if anything that you have worked on across your career adds some insight or a workaround or a hack or some way to mitigate the lack of trust in America because- 100% yes. Let me keep going though. But even you- Pretty clearly, I'm sure my audience listening, half the audience will be like, oh, yes, I share Francis's view about Twitter. And half that audience is going to say, what is she talking about? Of course. But in both sides could be right. Here's the thing. If my job was to earn trust with your listeners, I would have had a very different conversation with you. My job was with you to go deep into the issues and controversy is good. And let's find out where we disagree. I have spent the last 10 years helping organizations rebuild trust or build it in the first place. So we know well, it's super well understood, how do you build trust, which is if the listeners of your podcast that don't trust me right now, I can guarantee you it's for one of three reasons. That is, trust has three pillars to it. When you experience those three pillars, you will end up trusting me. When you don't experience one of them, you will not trust me. Those three pillars are authenticity, logic, and empathy. Everyone who's listening to me without even realizing what they're doing, they're deciding, am I saying what I believe? And they're probably like, yeah, you're being authentic. You are saying what you believe. I agree. That's a fair statement. I think either if they're not trusting me, they're going to doubt my logic because they think that the way in which I put together the data is not logical to them. And there is no amount of authenticity and empathy that can overcome a shortcoming in logic. I can't double down on authenticity to make up for a logic fall. If you doubt my logic, if you doubt the rigor of my logic, you're not going to trust me. For other people in the audience, they'd be like, maybe there is the research that she's talking about. Maybe it's the real her and maybe she is logical, but I don't think she gets us. You'd be doubting my empathy. There's no amount of logic that can overcome an empathy problem, and we call it an empathy wobble. The way to solve a problem for trust is to diagnose which of the three is at play. And the reason you have to diagnose which of the three is at play, because the prescription to overcome authenticity versus logic versus empathy are radically different. In my experience, trust is at the center of all problems. What we know, and we've worked with hundreds of thousands of people and tens of thousands of organizations In every single instance, trust always comes down to these three things, which is why we refer to it rather famously as the trust triangle. I can't wait till there's a fourth one because then we'll have the trust quadrangle. It has been a trust triangle for quite some time. So as I listen to you and I go back to our Twitter example, because that's where it got a little bit interesting, is that I think that somebody like Musk and perhaps some of those straight white guys like me on the right, so to speak would probably say she doesn't understand us. 
So you think I have an empathy wobble in my language? I didn't feel it anywhere else in this conversation except the Twitter example. Well, you should know what we do is help people understand what their propensity to wobble is. I am an empathy wobbler. If somebody is going to lose trust with me, it's going to be for reasons of empathy. It's rarely authenticity and it's rarely logic, which is why I married an empathy anchor, someone who's really good at it because we're together really good. I hope I can recall it. I've not seen it before, but I really like the idea of the three components of trust. It does allow me to not have an emotional conversation with you, to not get into a tit for tat. It allows me to sit back and say, okay, she just explained trust as these three components. I'm listening to her over the course of this conversation for 45 minutes. What of those components did she perhaps expose herself on in terms of where I could see people feeling, well, she doesn't get us. Like you said, the empathy wobble. It's 100% empathy. So I had an empathy wobble in this, which is I'm trusted most of the time, like many of us. And any time that trust breaks down for me, it's for reasons of empathy. And I do encourage your listeners to think for them in the moments when they have not built trust, which one of the three broke down? You'll find empathy is the biggest wobble. Logic will be second if history repeats and authenticity will be third. And the reason it's again important to know is that we have prescriptions on how to overcome each of them. This is why we can move fast and fix things because if you identify the trust that is broken down, we can fix that trust by a really careful diagnosis and then a clever prescription. And now we've removed that friction and now we're moving even faster and we don't have to go back and fix the collateral damage that we did along the way. Let me bring up another big name that I almost forgot about, a quite famous story, a company that you've had some experience with, some exposure with, WeWork. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're not trying to do a retrospective here and we don't have enough time. For me, when I look at something like WeWork and I was quite fascinated, I had not really understood the background of the CEO of SoftBank for the longest time. And he's a fascinating story. And I mean, complete riverboat gambler. I mean, the ups and downs of his fortune is just, it's insane. I don't have the stomach for it's it. Insane. I can tell you that. I'd last a day. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy what he's done, but he's done it. And it's just amazing. To me, it looks like as an outsider, and I would love for you to comment on this. It looks like for him, and I don't know if he had a special affinity for WeWork or in terms of the amount of capital he invested, if it was much higher than something else, I don't know. It looks like to me that his view of WeWork was another one of our investments, venture capitalist mindset, if it all goes away, whatever, we've done this before, whereas the people that are receiving the capital, receiving the investment, they're going to make this company, they can't have that perspective. This is super fun. So I'm going to ask you the question. For WeWork, because companies like individuals have wobbles. For example, when I got to Uber, now that we have this language, Uber had an empathy wobble and a logic wobble. They didn't know how to manage, and then they didn't have very much empathy for regulators and for drivers and the like. And so we shored those up in very quick order, by the way. Let me ask you, which did WeWork have? I didn't think the leader was authentic at all. It was just a couple video clips, and you're like, okay, how did this guy seduce whoever he seduced? or persuaded, maybe is a better word. How did he persuade whoever he had to persuade? To me, it was all inauthentic. The logic of it too, I thought to myself, this isn't going to work. So it was both of those. Yeah. But the authenticity is, do you think that Adam, Adam Newman, the CEO, was different behind the scenes than in front of the scenes? From my getting to work there, I thought he was the same guy. I thought he was very authentic. Now, you can disagree about whether or not you like that. To me, what he was thinking matched what he was saying completely. The logic wobble, to your second point, I mean, if you look at the IPO document that they created, it had no rhyme or reason. And I would imagine that Masasan from SoftBank, the investors are supposed to make sure that we add rigor. I actually think Masasan lowered the bar on rigor and logic for Adam and even encouraged him to be even more logical. So we work had a very different problem than Uber. Uber had an empathy wobble. WeWork had a logic wobble. I worked with a company called Riot Games, an amazing, amazing organization, but they had an authenticity wobble. Their employees were like, just please be the organization you say you are. We're so tired of hearing you say we're this, and then you're contradicting it. 
just be who you say you are. That's an authenticity wobble. And that's why what WeWork should do to fix it is very different than what Uber should have done. And it's very different than what Riot should have done, because you have to know which of the three is at play. Just on the authentic part of WeWork, I don't know him. I've not met him. I've seen some press stuff. Okay. So there's my disclaimer. Let's say that I saw him in public and saw him in private. Both times I said to myself, I would not take directions to the bathroom from this man. That means you're questioning his logic. You're not questioning his authenticity. It's important to clarify there because people might miss that point. If a guy is bad in public and bad in private, he's authentic. He's totally authentic. You either are going to doubt his empathy or his logic. And in Adam's case, it was mostly logic. Elon Musk, we can both agree, he's totally, totally authentic. My gosh, I think of myself as very authentic. I got nothing on Elon Musk. That's one of the reasons he's so successful, clearly. I think, listen, this is one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time, which is why it was so heartbreaking to me to watch what looked to me like, oh my gosh, you didn't need to do these self-inflicted harms. You could have done this with logic and with empathy. I thought the company, when he bought it, could be turned around and fixed in like 60 days. It's dragged on now for so long and he's still trying to solve it. What's really interesting about Twitter, let's be frank, Twitter, before Musk bought it, had a left-leaning perspective. Definitely. Definitely. Now it has a right-leaning perspective. What's interesting about your statement is 60 days to fix it. You could have had both in 60 days. But what does that say about the people that owned and started Twitter if it would have only taken 60 days to fix and they didn't do it? Our book, Move Fast and Fix Things, is how to turn around your company in five days. We organize it by Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Jack Dorsey's a smart guy. He's a billionaire. He is. He had all kinds of smart people. It's an amazing statement from a Harvard professor to say that Twitter could have been turned around in 60 days. Absolutely true. Musk has had it for a year, and these other folks had it for what? I don't know, a decade, whatnot. That's an amazing perspective from you. By the way, when I go in and help companies, this is how long it takes. At Uber, many people thought it should go out of business. All of the problems that were there when we got there were cleaned up in six months. One of the reasons I went there is because it was so public and so bad that if we could fix it there, no one else had as severe of problems. So everyone else could do it faster. This is the controversial part. And this is what I want to go and evangelize around the world. If you do it our way, you can move much, much faster. And I don't blame people for not knowing it's a secret memo and we're making the secret memo public. It doesn't have anything to do with how intelligent you are. If we keep using Twitter as an example, as much negative that you put on the table in this conversation about Musk and what he's done, I would put the exact counter on the table and say that the problems at Twitter as an outsider looking in before Musk bought it were not fixed on purpose. Why were they not fixed on purpose? I would say, well, hold on. Okay, before Musk bought it, Twitter was a left-leaning site. It's now a right-leaning site. It's irresponsible for us not to say that there are political consequences with Twitter, i.e. the president before the current president was banned from Twitter. It's a complicated issue here, but for me, I'm kind of like, well, why was Twitter not fixed? Under Dorsey, it seems like it was not fixed on purpose. Musk gets a little more time to see if he turns it around. He doesn't need more time. This is my point. Keep it at the Dorsey part, though, my point about- Okay, I'll keep it to the Dorsey part. The point that I'm making, which is, it seems like if I'm following through your logic of this conversation, they did not want to fix things under Dorsey for whatever reason. Yeah, here's how I will say it. You're saying they knew it and they didn't do it. The only obstacle to fixing things in my mind, and this is what I tell people all the time, I can't give you the willingness to change. We can give you the secret memo and everything else. But if you don't have the willingness to change, I can't be helpful. When you're saying, for whatever reason, they didn't have the willingness to change. And in that case, it's not going to get fixed. The second you have the willingness to change, we can do it super quickly. You have identified exactly the one obstacle that I personally have never been able to budge. I'm going to flip it to something really quick because we've talked about some companies that have had some ups and downs. 
And I want to bring it to the company that doesn't appear to really have ups and downs anymore. They did in the early stages of the company in the 90s and whatnot until all of a sudden they had an iPhone. It does seem like when we look at Apple, okay, we can quibble on the margins. We can say, gosh, it would have been nice to see if Steve Jobs is still alive and maybe there would have been something different. We could say, okay, maybe they're on cruise control now and they just get people to buy new models and the innovation's not there. But in terms of looking at Apple and saying, are they doing anything that doesn't seem to be in the best interest of the company and the shareholders? And they do seem to be going in a direction where you just want to say they seem to do it the right way. (laughs) Yeah. And so here's what I would say. We believe in their authenticity. We believe in their logic and we believe in their empathy. And they have more user empathy than maybe any company on the package. Even the wrapping on the boxes is like a self-satisfying opening. I agree with you. Microsoft today is another company that I think is firing on all cylinders, has had pockets of doing it well and not doing it. Apple is a beautiful example. Microsoft is remarkably has turned some things around, which is quite surprising to me because I always thought they were just going to spin off cash on all these licenses for the operating systems and for Word and Excel and stuff. They have turned something around. They are, and Satya Nadelli, Kathleen Hogan, and Amy Hood, the CEO, CHRO, and CFO, are an unbelievable team. They're one of our research sites because they live this. He has moved the company so much faster, and he has done it without sacrificing humanity. And I'm not saying not having layoffs. Layoffs are a part of organizations. He's increased the empathy. He's increased the logic. He's increased the authenticity. That has permitted them to move at breathtaking speed. Look where they are on AI now. It's not at all a surprise to me that they're even winning there because they were getting everything else right along the way. The fact that Microsoft is beating Google at AI is amazing. Isn't it just breathtaking? It's amazing, really. I can't believe even for me, for someone that wants to go experiment with rewriting some sentences on AI, the fact that I'm going to use the Bing browser versus Google It blows my mind every time I log in. It blows my mind. (laughs) We're running out of time here. We didn't get a chance to go into it. I think it'd be an interesting conversation. Maybe we can always follow up on it. This would be even more controversial, but you brought up the word earlier, inclusion. You're kind of leading two lives here from what I can observe. You've got the life that we're talking about in this conversation, but you also have some other perspectives that I think are really interesting. The fact that you're at Harvard, there are some controversies surrounding Harvard. For example, the Asian students and whatnot being limited on admissions. It is an interesting perspective, not really getting a chance to dig into it on this conversation. Maybe we can do another one, but that's a really interesting topic. And I've not really done it on this podcast. I think, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, I think you and I could do it. I believe we could. I think there's a mutual back and forth respect. Totally. From your perspective, I can guess that you probably have to feel out an interviewer to find, to find out if they're going to only turn the flamethrower on you versus is it going to be a back and forth? Because I think you would push me and I would push you. I would love it. In closing of this, but we can do it next time, move fast and fix things. It's organized by five days a week. So Monday is identify your real problem. Solve for trust. That's what we just did. Wednesday is make new friends. And that's at the heart of whether or not they're having discrimination there. And that's what I mean when I know that if I get more ideas, so if I only get to talk to a left-leaning crowd, I am limited by how much intelligence I'm going to get. And if I only get to talk to a right-leaning crowd, I am limited by how much intelligence I can get. But if we can have a conversation with both, we will have infinitely better ideas, which means we all have to make new friends. And it turns out there's a very systematic way to do that. I don't know how much you know about me, and this was not a planned thing for me to do this podcast. I've written a bunch of investment books. I got bored only talking to traders after the first year or two, and then I somehow or another got Daniel Kahneman to appear on here. And then once Kahneman- Oh, a hero, a hero. Once Kahneman appeared, then nobody was willing to say no to me when I asked them cold turkey, because they're like, if Kahneman (laughs) appeared, I better go on there. Who is this guy? That's beautiful. I probably talked to 20 Harvard professors in this podcast. Even the names, I couldn't even recall them all. There's so many. Yeah, it's totally fine. We are interchangeable in the limit. I don't know if that's necessarily true. Well, listen, I hope you enjoyed this. Again, the book, Move Fast and Fix Things, The Trusted Leader's Guide to Solving Hard Problems. It's an interesting conversation, really. I really love the part about looking at 
a trust issue and thinking about the authenticity, logic, and empathy part of it. It doesn't necessarily mean people are going to agree. Even if you get it out there, people are still going to have differences of opinion, but at least that allows a systematic way to break it apart. Indeed. Cool stuff. Hey, where can we send people, Francis? Where would you like to send people to? Anne and I have a podcast ourselves called Fixable with Anne and Francis, and it's a call-in show. If you ever listened to Car Talk growing up, I know about it, yes. Yeah, so you could call in with any car problem and these two brothers would solve it. Anne and I have a call-in show where you can call in with any workplace problem. We'll fix it in 30 minutes. Do this move fast and fix things. We can solve any workplace problem that an individual has in 30 minutes. People from all over the world call in. We love variety. If you're curious about how we do it and how we fix things, give a listen to the Fixable. It's from the TED Audio Network, but it's called Fixable with Anne and Francis, or as Anne likes to say, Fixable AF. Francis, I appreciate it again. Hopefully we can catch up again in the future. I would love it. I have some regret about losing trust with half of your audience. In my defense, I had no idea who your audience was. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a note to self. Don't assume. Don't assume. <laughs> I will do better. You've made a difference in my life and I appreciate it. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.